Good evening, everyone. My name is Rira, and on behalf of Roman's Bookstore, I'd like to welcome you all to our virtual event with Deborah Thomas and Gail Brandeis. Um, unfortunately, Alma was unable to make it tonight uh, due to connection issues, so um, apologies for that. But we're so grateful that all of you could make it out tonight and that our bookstore is able to continue bringing authors and their works to our community, especially during this uncertain time. Um, we will be continuing to do more virtual events in the near future. And our next virtual event is scheduled for Tuesday, June 16th at 6 p.m. with Bethany C. Morrow and Emily Henry. Uh, you can learn more about future events on our website's calendar as well as our social media. And this evening's event includes a Q&A. To submit a question, please use the ask a question function at the very bottom of the screen. Um, if you see a question on the list you'd like for our guests to answer, you can vote for it and the question will make its way to the very top of the list. And of course, we'll try to answer as many questions as time will allow. Um, and if you're interested in purchasing the featured book tonight, uh, Lutz, then you can click on the green button below. It's directly below the viewer screen. Um, by clicking on the link, it will take you to our website where you can purchase your, uh, where you can complete your purchase. And uh, with that said, let me introduce our guest speakers for this evening. Deborah Thomas holds a bachelor's and a master's in English from California State University, Northridge, and attended the UCLA Extension Writers Program. She has taught literature and writing at a Los Angeles public high school and English as a second language to adults from all over the world. Her experience as an advocate for immigrant and refugee rights led her to write her debut book, Lutz. And she is currently at work on her second novel. Joining her tonight is Gail Brandeis, uh, the author of the novel in poems from Many Restless Concerns and the memoir, The Art of Misdiagnosis, Surviving My Mother's Suicide. Her essays, poems, and short fiction have been widely published in venues such as the New York Times, the Washington Post, the Rumpus, the Oprah Magazine, and more. Uh, she teaches uh, in the BA and low residency MFA programs at Sierra ne Nevada College, where she was named Distinguished Visiting Professor slash Writer in Residence. And with that said, I'm gonna pass the screen over to uh, Deborah and Gail uh, and enjoy the talk, everyone. Hey, thank you so much, Rira. And thank you everyone for joining us tonight. It's such a pleasure to be here with all of you and to be here with Debbie. Uh, you'll see her name on her book as Deborah Thomas, but I know her as Debbie, so you'll hear both. <laughs> and this is an event that I've been looking forward to since 2004 when Debbie first took my novel writing class at the University of California, um, Los Angeles Extension Writers Program, where I think you took a few classes with me, including a writing for social change class. And I fell in love with Debbie's work. It's so compassionate, so deeply observant, uh, reminiscent to me of Barbara Kingsolver, who's one of my very favorite writers. And I've, it's been such a blessing to stay in touch with Debbie over the years to move from the teacher-student relationship to a friendship, which I value so deeply. And she shared with me her process, which you'll get to hear about writing this book. I saw it go through a few different titles mm -hmm. and some different structures. And I am just so, um, so delighted to be able to talk to you, Debbie tonight. Okay. I wish, oh, <laughs> I so wish that Alma Luz Villanueva had been able to join us. I feel like a bridge between the two of you. She had been my mentor when I was getting my MFA at uh, Antioch University, where I also teach. And there was a time when Debbie was finally ready to send the book out into the world, but wanted to make sure that she was getting the story right. And as a white woman, I wasn't necessarily the right person. I, I wasn't the right person to say whether this story was authentic. And, and I suggested, although it felt authentic to me, but that it wasn't my place to say so as a white woman. So I suggested that she reach out to Amaluz Villanueva, 
who loved the book. And I'm going to read a little bit um, of Alma's introduction, her foreword. But first, I want to tell you a little bit about Alma. For those of you who haven't heard of her, I hope you all have, because her work is just so stunning and beautiful. Um, Alma Luz Villanueva is the author of four novels, most recently Song of the Golden Scorpion and Eight Books of Poetry, most recently Gracias, winner of the Penn Oakland Award for her novel Naked Ladies, American Book Award for her novel The Ultraviolet Sky, amongst other awards. Her work has been published in many anthologies and textbooks. She taught in the MFA in creative writing, Antioch University for 20 years, where I had the pleasure of working with her and then teaching with her and miss her there terribly. She's lived in San Miguel de Allende, Mexico for the past 15 years and has a large familia, even great grandchildren. Mm -hmm. um, she's, she can't join us because of the connectivity issues, because of lightning. Mm -hmm. um, and if you know Alma, she has a tattoo of a lightning bolt on her foot. Lightning is important to her and I hope that it is filling her with inspiration right now. We miss you, Alma. Um, so I'm just gonna read a little bit of her foreword. And I want to show you the, um, the lovely new seal on Debbie's book as winner of the 2020 Next Generation Indie Book Award in Multicultural Literature, which is so beautifully deserved. And I'm just so thrilled that, uh, that this, this is here. Okay, so this is Alma's forward. When I was first contacted by Deborah Thomas to perhaps read through with commentary her novel Loose, having to do with the immigrant experience, Mexico, Central America, those crossing the border to the United States, risking their lives, many dying, that dangerous crossing, I was hesitant. Deborah is not a Latina. And so I replied that I needed to know more about the impetus to write a novel with these immigrant themes, her concerns, the whys of the desire to write this novel, Deborah responded fully in a passionate email, which is now in an author's note at the end of the novel. When I read that she's worked with immigrant communities in Southern California for decades, is an immigrant rights activist, has toured with Amnesty International to the US-Mexico border, speaking to people both sides of the border, including border patrol agents, and left jugs of water, the Blue Flags Water Station Project in the Imperial Valley Desert, for immigrants who would otherwise die of thirst and heat, and thousands do, I agreed to read this novel, and I'm so glad I did. This novel and all the characters continue to resonate with me. Of course, I was struck first of all that her main character is Alma, her daughter Luce. I laughed out loud as I'm Alma Luce. Then the opening of the novel with Alma and Luz leads to recuerdo, memory. And from then on, I was carried like a soft wind then a strong wind to a stronger wind to a tornado wind. That final crossing into the States, a brutal attack, which I had to put down a few times in order to read it through. Millions of immigrants experience this brutality daily, globally, I told myself, keep reading. As it is with every scene, chapter, dialogue, each character, it was absolutely necessary. I'm going to skip a bit. She goes on to say, this is a novel of great tenderness and great brutality. You will witness via this novel, Martin Luther King's words that Deborah quotes in the opening, darkness cannot drive out darkness, only light can do that. You will experience door a loose to give birth, to give to the light, believe me. I believe you, Oma, I miss you, Oma. Um, so that's just a little taste of, of this beautiful forward to this beautiful, beautiful, compassionate, unforgettable novel. Thank you, Gail. Oh, my pleasure. And I, it's just so wonderful to see your face and to be able to talk to you. Oh, I'm so happy. And I, I know you haven't been feeling well, and it means the world to me that you're, you've made it here tonight. Uh, I, I, I wouldn't miss you, it. You, you've been here with me through so many ups and downs and ups and downs and ups and downs. So thank you for being here tonight. It's my total honor and pleasure. And I'm so excited that this beautiful book is shining its light into the world. Now, you know, as, as I said, I've, I've been in love with this book for a very long time through its various incarnations and it's just, just a joy. So 
Alma touched upon your inspiration for the book a little bit in her foreword there, but I'd love to hear you talk about what led you to write this book and what your journey was with it. Well, um, it spans decades. Um, it actually began in the 1990s um, after I'd finished um, getting my degree in, uh, in, in literature. The first job I got was teaching uh, English as a second language to adults from all over the world. But most of my students were from Mexico and Central America. And I felt such an immediate connection to them, a genuine connection, because they reminded me of my Italian uh, family, my Italian upbringing. When I was a little girl, we lived in an Italian neighborhood for the first five, six years of my life. Uh, and then even when we moved 10 whole minutes away, <laughs> that was still the center of our world. Every, every weekend, the Italian church. And being around my, my Mexican and Central American students, the language, Spanish is so like Italian. My dad used to say things to me in Italian that sounded like Spanish because the, the language is so close. The music, the ranchera music my students would play on their breaks um, was like the, uh, the music my grandfather used to play with his little hand accordion, his squeeze a box as he called it. And the religion, the Catholic, the Catholic faith, the Virgin Mary, Virgin of Guadalupe, there were so many similarities. And um, at this time in my life, I was having some personal problems and I was 3000 miles away from family. And being with them, I would love to go into work. I felt like I was with family. I felt that kind of warm, loving connection. Well, at the same time in the 90s, I was reading in the newspaper and on the news, the deaths of the migrants in the desert, week after week after week. Um, the Mexican economy had plummeted after a North American free trade agreement uh, devalued the peso. And they were coming across the border um, in huge numbers. And so our government in response created something called Operation Gatekeeper in California, Operation Safeguard in Arizona. And what that meant was increased fencing, high-tech lighting, underground sensors, in the hopes of deterrence. But it didn't deter anyone. They were so desperate, they were being pushed east through the deserts, through treacherous mountain paths, and they were dying week after week, month after month. And I kept hearing about it, reading about it, hearing my students talk about it. And I've always been the sort of person that believed you don't just talk about something, think about something, you do something, do what you can, whatever small or large thing you can do. And so I, I looked around and got involved in Amnesty International with a focus on immigrant and refugee rights. And I had some um, experiences that were life changing. I got to, to tour a detention center. Uh, it was on Terminal Island at the time in Long Beach, just like a prison. Um, and I got to experience um, both sides of the border with Border Links, which is an organization that takes people both sides of the border. You talk to people. Border Patrol, factory uh, workers, all sorts of, it was quite an eye-opening experience. And then I also heard about Water Stations Project. Father Richard Estrada, John Hunter, and Enrique Morones. These men organized volunteers and would take them out into the desert to leave water and mark them with blue flags. And I had an opportunity to join them, um, putting the water out on the blue flag, and, uh, and then in the Holtville Cemetery in the back was a dirt lot where the unidentified remains of, 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 of migrants had been buried. There were little bricks that said Jane Doe, John Doe. And we decorated them with paper flowers and no olvidado signs, not forgotten. And we said prayers and I got to read a, a passage about what the blue flags meant to me. So I didn't, I, I was a writer and so activism wasn't enough. Uh, I needed to write about it. Uh, so this was in 2000, 2002 when I first started writing and I did what I called the Barbara Kingsolver approach as we talked about. She's my favorite writer. And I thought, well, you know, I should write from my point of view. Uh, Italian American woman, my character came from upstate New York to California to help a brother who was in trouble. And while there she learns about the deaths in the desert and and so a little bit of that is, is woven in like Barbara Kingsolver does with her work. You know, she, she'll have like the bean trees was about a young white Southern girl who travels to find herself and ends up involved in the sanctuary movement with the Guatemalan refugees. So she would thread through social justice issues with mm -hmm. uh, uh, you know, her story. And so that's what I did. I wrote that I think between 2002, 2004, and then I set it aside 
And that summer I saw Gail Brandeis, winner of the Barbara Kingsolver Award for Social Justice, uh, Book of Dead Birds, was teaching a class. And I thought, well, I'm gonna try that. So I started your class and I don't even remember what the assignment was, but I began uh, writing in the voice of a young Mexican girl whose father had disappeared crossing the desert. And that voice just poured out of me. I, it wasn't like, should I, could I? I didn't know where it was gonna go. It wasn't like I'm gonna write a novel. It was an assignment and I just went with it. And her voice just felt so genuine. It was the most fluid writing experience I've ever had. And if you're a writer or any kind of artist, you know how difficult it is. Sometimes it's hard to get going or to keep going, but this just, just kept going. Her almost voice was the voice of everybody I'd read about, everybody I'd met, everything I'd seen. Uh, her voice led me to other characters whose stories I had heard about. And uh, it, it just, um, I just kept going with it. It just felt right. And that was in 2006. That's where the inspiration came from. And between then and now has been another journey in itself. So <laughs> <laughs> would you like to share some of that journey with us? Well, I think it can be helpful to hear about the various ups and downs of the I writing life. And I think there's some writers with us um, today and they certainly have, have been through that themselves. Um, I tried to find an agent in 2006 when I first finished what was then called Searching for Dolores. And I had a very hard time. I had no author platform, no awards, and, you know, nothing to, uh, you know, talk about. It took me about a year and a half, two years. I finally found an agent, Leticia Gomez. She was starting her own agency and she she took the, the novel and did a pretty good job. She got it to a couple of big houses in New York and they uh, took the whole manuscript, held on to it for a few months and ultimately passed. This was 2008, 2009, which I've since found out was the worst time to try to get published because of the recession and publishing houses were downsizing and letting editors go. Mm -hmm. But needless to say, I was devastated after all of that. And I stopped writing for a while. And then when I did write a little bit off and on, it, I didn't have the same momentum. So in 2014, to give myself a little spark of enthusiasm, I went to a writer's conference in Monterey. And uh, there I met Elizabeth McKenzie. She's a writer and an editor and she was uh, teaching the fiction class that I had taken. And we had lunch together one day and talked about our experiences. And when she heard the story about searching for Dolores, she said, you know, I'd really love to see this manuscript if, if you wanna send it. Uh, we had been talking about a different thing I was working on, but she said, this sounds interesting. So I sent it to her. A Couple months later, she said, you know, Debbie, this is not a practice novel. This is the real deal. And it deserved your blood, sweat and tears to get it back out there which you kept telling me, yes, yes, yes. Mm -hmm. And so she gave me wonderful advice on how to expand it. She pointed out areas she thought were weak that needed to be built up a little bit more. And so I got back to work on it off and on, but I just didn't have that same drive, that same excitement that I initially did. And then in 2016 and 17, the political situation and the situation with immigrants and refugees in our country, I, I, I wanted to do something. And so I thought, let me, let me try this again. And so I got back to work feverishly on it and really put my heart and soul. And that's when you told me about She Writes Press, which is a woman's independent um, press. And you don't have to have an agent to contact them. You send them the manuscript and they get hundreds and they only print about 80 a year, I think. But um, I thought, you know, rather than this hunt for an agent, oh, the agent that I had used was no longer uh, representing fiction anymore. So anyway, um, I, you know, I said, okay, I'm going to send it to them. But before I did, that's when I decided, you know, I need some eyes, um, Latina writer who knows both the U.S. and Mexico. I knew Alma Luz Villanueva from your, I, uh, from Antioch University. And I thought, mm, I wonder if she would consider looking at it. I didn't know her. So I sent her an email. And at first she said, what made you write this novel? And so I, I wrote a long, passionate email to her in return, and she answered and said, uh, you are not Latina, but you have borne witness to La Luz. So send me the manuscript, but I warn you, I will be brutally honest. And I said, well, that's what I want. And I waited and my heart pounding for a few weeks. And when she finally contacted me, it was with just overwhelming support and encouragement. She's been wonderful ever since that day. 
encouraging me. And uh, she ended up writing the foreword, which I am so grateful for. And so I sent it to She Writes Press with that little bit of confidence boost. And, and here it is now. Yay. <laughs> oh, I'm so delighted. <laughs> and um, this book, you know, comes on the heels of American Dirt. And we would be remiss not to discuss that and, you know, the rightful controversy around that book, um, which many rightfully think was full of stereotype. I have not written, read it myself, but have um, been so appreciative of criticism from people like Miriam Gerba. And I so appreciate the, um, what was it, Dignidad Literaria movement that arose from it um, via Miriam. Mm -hmm. And Romans was at the center of that too. I know that originally Janine Cummings was going to read at Romans and there was going to be a protest and her reading was canceled, but there was a Dignidad Literaria event held in the Romans courtyard, which sounded wonderful with a lot of writers I know and, and really respect. And um, so your, your beautiful book comes out on the heels of, of this controversy when there's a lot of talk about um, cultural appropriation and the, the beautiful own voices movement. And I'd love to hear your thoughts about bringing a book into the world in a voice from a culture different from your own, how to avoid the pitfalls that American Dirt um, fell into. And um, just you, you, for those who would like to, to see some of Debbie's thoughts, there's a beautiful essay that she wrote about writing across difference, which is available on um, women, Writers, women's book. Yes, yes. Yeah, yes. But, uh, I would love for you to share your thoughts just around this cultural moment and, and what it means to write across difference right now. Well, certainly I was quite concerned, which is why I contacted um, Alma Luce to begin with. And then when this controversy happened, I was I was quite shaken. Um, Alma Luce immediately, uh, you know, gave me some confidence. Don't worry, your characters are genuine. My publisher, Brooke, said the same thing. But that's not to say that there, um, it, it's certainly certainly an issue to, to confront. And I support Own Voices movement. They have a, a right and a reason to be there. Uh, in Reina Grande's words, for too long, too many voices have been silenced or minimized and others elevated. And there, it, there is a need. And, a, and the best thing that came out of the American Dirt controversy was to shake up the publishing industry Yes. And to open their minds so that they will now, you know, start to look at more diverse voices. So that is very important. And I respect that. And I respect the fact that some people will, will say that, you know, they don't want to read my book, that my book doesn't tell their story. I can relate to that in a lot of different ways. I remember when I finished grad school and all I had read was books by men, you know, a little bit of, of women's. But when I finished, I just started reading women, 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 because I wanted to hear that voice. Um, when I taught high school, I, my students were primarily Latino, and I made sure I incorporated Sandra Cisneros, uh, Luis Rodriguez, you know, um, our, our authors that they could relate to. So I appreciate mm -hmm. that. But I also think there's a place for all voices. Um, no, I don't know firsthand what it's like to be a young Mexican girl uh, crossing the border. Um, but I, I think I've had enough experience and heard enough voices and Alma's voice is all the voices I've heard that I hope that comes through and that there is an audience out there who can read her voice and her story and be moved. Um, that's, you know, that that's my my hope. Um, but I was glad to hear Rena Grande say at the, the panel with Oprah that every storyteller has, has the right to write whatever story speaks to their heart as long as they do it with honesty and integrity and responsibility. And the research that I did do, which I talk about in the, the essay that I wrote, uh, Daniel Older Jose, Rebecca Mackay, have each written wonderful essays about this because um, Rebecca Mackay wrote a, a novel about the AIDS crisis in the uh, 80s. And she was not a gay man and was a kid during that time. Um, and yet she wrote a great novel. And she said, you have to be honest with yourself as to why did you write this? You have to really look at every little detail, every little uh, bit of information to make it as broad and authentic. And then 
use sensitivity readers so that they can pick up the things that you might have missed. So to me, that was, was one thing. But then there was something else, um, and that's called finding common ground. And I believe that we're all united, that we're all, we have common shared experiences, shared humanity. And I think that if we can tap into those, for example, I know what it is to love a parent and lose a parent. I know what it is to have a fierce bond with your sister who's here with me tonight. Mm -hmm. We can all relate to that. Um, we can relate to having children that we want to support and trying to find the best way that we can take care of them. And, 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 and so if, if my readers can connect with all those shared experiences, the common ground, and then go on the journey with Alma and, and learn something, open their minds, open their perceptions to the life of an undocumented immigrant that maybe um, my book has a place with all the other voices. Wonderful, thank you. You mentioned Sandra Cisneros and Luis Rodriguez who beautifully blurbed your, your novel. Um, I was wondering if there are any other Latinx voices, writers that you'd like to amplify right now and also share some of your other um, writerly influences. Well, I'm glad you asked that because this is a book, if, if you've already bought my book, Loose, <laughs> um, and they're asking you to purchase something from Vromans, and I certainly wish you would because Vromans has been kind enough to do this for me. Um, and so those of you who have already purchased a book, you could always purchase another one and donate it. You could purchase Gales, you could purchase children's books, you could purchase, there's a wonderful selection of books about uh, Black Lives Matter. But this book I just finished reading, it's called The Undocumented Americans. If you wanna enlighten yourself and you talk about own voices, it's written by Carla Cornejo Villavicencio. She is a Harvard graduate who's a dreamer, uh, DACA, Excuse me, my mail keeps popping up. I don't know how, why on my computer. Um, um, she's under DACA. And so she's writing in her own voice. What she did is she traveled the country and interviewed undocumented immigrants. And you will hear their own voices and her own voice. And th it, this to me was just such an important book um, to, to get out there. Um, mm -hmm. Luis Alberto Urea. Oh, my goodness. I love him. Mm -hmm. Mostly I love Into the Beautiful North which is another great book you guys could get um, It's a, it, because it's got humor in it. He's talking about a serious situation about a, a town in Mexico that is dying, that all the men have gone to El Norte and the criminal elements coming in, but the young female protagonist sees the movie, The Magnificent Seven, and she gets this idea, I'm gonna go to El Norte and find seven magnificent Mexican men and bring them back to the village. And, and you know, he uses humor to, to tell an important story, so. Uh, but as far as uh, writers that have, have inspired me, of course, Barbara Kingsolver, uh, Toni Morrison, Beloved, oh, the tree imagery in that book, uh, Louise Erdrich, uh, The Painted Drum is the magical realism. It's, it's just absolutely beautiful. Um, and Khaled Hosseini's books, not so much The Kite Runner for me as his other two books, which were about women in Afghanistan. Um, they just really moved me. So. Wonderful. Well, um, could you please read from your own book so we can, after hearing about your influences and how the voice came came through you, I'd love for you to give a taste of this voice to our listeners here today. Okay. All righty. Thank you. Um, I, I don't want to give anything away of uh, details of the plot, so I'm just going to read from the prologue. And I say this because there was a famous Russian novel big thick novel that I decided one summer I was going to read and I was so excited I sat down opened it up and the first sentence said even though she throws herself under the train in the end and it ruined it for me so I learned <laughs> don't you know you want to read a book and not know anything uh when you start reading so prologue this is what you would read if you opened up the book okay Los Angeles 2015 you don't know anything my daughter Luce shouts stamping her foot in defiance at 14, she thinks she knows everything. Yesterday, it was about a boy who was old enough to drive a car, a car she will never ride in unless he's willing to wait until she's 18. Today, her anger is fueled by yesterday's argument as she tells me that I know nothing about the Central American children who are fleeing poverty and crime and have been detained at the Texas border. If she only knew what I do know, but I can't tell her, not everything. 
We had been watching the news when the screen filled suddenly with young brown faces and a headline, the kids are back, referring to the previous year's migrant children desperate to cross the border and those newly arrived. Despite the government's attempts to handle the crisis, children were still coming. I wanted to take them all in my arms. Those with eyes full of fear and worry were clinging to each other, but there were others seated slightly apart, some with sagging shoulders and empty eyes, and one with arms crossed, chin lifted in a cold, piercing gaze. I had seen these eyes before, all of them. I had whispered softly, mostly to myself, God bless you, Pobrecito, perhaps you should have stayed home. My daughter jumped up from her chair and exploded with her, you don't know anything, remark, followed by, just because you crossed the border a long time ago, you think you know what's happening today? She is standing above me, hands on her hips, leaning forward. Gone is the gentle face of my sister Rosa, whom Luz resembles in her sleep. In its place are my stubborn squint and firm pressed lips. As always, I search for traces of Manuel, but right now I see mostly my younger, angry self as Luz continues with her lecture on my ignorance. Many of them are just little kids. You were older. They had no one to help them like you did. Some have no parents anywhere. You had a mama back home. Some are trying to get to a parent who is working in the United States, not missing like your papa, but actually there. This is not like you at all. They can't just stay home. She flips back her long thick hair and lets out an exasperated sigh. My Adamita warrior. A long time ago? Not so long, though it is a lifetime to her. I was just a couple of years older than Bruce when I made my journey, and then she was born. Her unexpected anger have stopped the tears that welled up in my eyes at the sight of those children. I yank out the yarn of my crocheting, for I have lost count. I didn't mean it that way, Luce. I'm not saying they shouldn't have come. I just meant, well, I know the hardships they must have endured. Not worse than the hardships they are fleeing, she says, her nostrils flaring like Manuel's when he was angry. I suppress a slight smile at this familiar sight and sigh. Maybe, maybe not. It's complicated. I look up into her dark eyes. There is much I wish I could tell her that she's so young. I've always thought that maybe one day when she is older, I could tell her more. I want her to know me, who I was, who I really am. But now as a flood of memory sends a chill that turns my hands ice cold, I tremble with the knowledge that she will never know my true story, but will always live with the safer one that I've given her. Perhaps this is the way of mothers and daughters. What, after all, did I ever really know of my own mother? Complicated, Luce is saying with a hint of sarcasm in her voice as she gathers up her school books and hugs into her chest. I'm going to my room. My math homework is complicated, but I want to figure it out myself. I don't need your help. This last bit is said to spite me, but I let it go. This is not her usual behavior. This is really about yesterday, about a boy. And we've tossed enough angry words about this apartment for one night, no more. I pick up my arm and begin to count again. Ten single crochets, skip the space, ten more. Should I have stayed in Mexico with Mama? The thought alone makes my stomach turn. But if I had stayed, if I hadn't searched for Papa, I think of Rosa, of Manuel, of the night of the blinding stars. Maybe Luce is right. Maybe I don't know anything. But one thing is certain. Luce can never know the truth of my journey. My precious Luce de Rosalba can never know. Rick Rosa. Beautiful. Thank you so much. What a what a joy to hear you read. Um, for those of you who have tuned in, you can ask a question by clicking on ask a question at the bottom of your screen. Um, we have one question here and we'll see if, uh, if more pop up. But um, there's the question, were you always a writer or, or was writing something that came later in your life? You touched upon that a little bit, but I'd love to hear a little bit more about your early writing life. Well, I always wanted to be a writer. Initially, um, I went to nursing school. Uh, my mom was quite ill most of her life and ended up with uh, multiple sclerosis. And so I was used to being in and out of hospitals because she was. And I was really comfortable in the hospital and it was always thought I should be a nurse. So I went to the local school of nursing there, Wilson School of Nursing. I think some of my friends are there that we went to nursing uh -huh. school together. And even there, I loved the English class. That was probably my favorite class that we had there. Um, 
and I would read voraciously and I tried writing a little bit at that time, even as a nurse. Then I moved out here to Los Angeles. My uh, first husband went to UCLA Law School and we moved out here for that. And I worked at UCLA Medical Center and I took some fiction writing classes there. And in fact, I hope my sister doesn't mind if I tell this story. I wrote a story called A Dignified Life and she was in college at the time and she needed a short story for a class and she asked if she could borrow one. <laughs> so I gave it to her and unbeknownst to her, the professor entered it in the school contest and it was <laughs> A Dignified Life by Dolores DeFolvio. And she sent me the $50. That was that was my public first publication. <laughs> So um, I took a lot of classes. I sent stories out. I would send them to the New Yorker and the Atlantic. Nothing, nothing, you know, tons, tons of. Uh, and uh, I tried writing a novel when my kids were little. And then I thought, you know, I, I need to learn more about literature. So when the kids were school aged, I went back to uh, school to study literature and writing. I got a bachelor's and a master's. So for me, that was what I was doing full time. I wasn't writing then. I was writing papers and reading. Uh, and when I finally finished, um, I did begin some writing. Um, I wrote a story called Pangea about characters Josie and Vic, a brother and sister. Uh, it's a story I loved so much. He's going off to Vietnam and she's heartbroken that he's leaving. And the book Blue Flags, the story that I first novel, I took those characters and put them into their 40s. And that's where I got that. So I've always, always done some writing since my 20s, but I am going to be 67 in a couple of weeks and I've got my first novel published. So things do come true. You've got to hang in there, persist and just keep trying. Wonderful. In your bio, it says you're working on your second novel and I'm wondering if you're returning to Blue Flags, which I, I love so much, the excerpts I've read, or if you're working on something new. Actually, I am taking, I have a few things, um, but that's one that I've been pulling out in the last year and looking at um, and calling it Pangea, the idea of the supercontinent pulling apart um, because the character, her father had abandoned them. The brother had been her, her strength and her mother was working two jobs to make ends meet. And uh, that takes place in um, when she's in her forties and her brother needs her in a crisis and so she goes to Los Angeles. So it's about this family that's pulling apart, but at the same time, it's coming back together, which in truth, the supercontinent is. But I want to add another level to it. I want to include horses because, as you know, I have horses. I, um, horses are very soulful creatures. I don't ride. I just love them. I love being with them. And I want to incorporate that. And so my character is going to have horses that she has to leave in New York when she goes out to California. And there's going to be an equine vet who helps take care of those horses. And mm -hmm. she'll be communicating with him by email back and forth. Uh, and I'm, I'm thinking of, of having maybe the beginnings of a relationship blossom uh, in there too. So add a bit of a love story to it as well. And it takes place in the year 2001. Uh, a year when things fell apart, but also came back together. So that's what I'm working on right now, Pangea. Great. I, we seem to have lost your video. I don't see your face really? anymore. Although really? I'm still able to hear you. Ah, oh. oh, I can see me and I can see you, although you're kind of fading. I don't know, Rira, what do you see? Are you there? Uh, I see both of you. You guys oh. are. Oh, okay. um, perfectly okay. visible to the audience okay great great it, it could just be my my mountain internet being weird um it looks like we have some other questions so how did you decide to write fiction instead of nonfiction? and have you considered writing a memoir okay to me and this my students if any of you are there you've heard me say this before i love fiction i love fiction um, I think that, as John Martell of Life of Pi says, that it can capture the essence of truth so powerfully. Um, even memoirs, um, nonfiction, none of that is the absolute truth because we all write um, from our own perception, whatever limited information we we you know gotten or remember or whatever. Um, but to me, fiction, if you create these characters and put them in a situation and make it uh, so that the, the reader experiences it, like Atticus Finch said, you know, get inside their skin and walk around in it. To me, that is just such a, a, a wonderful to experience other people's. 
not only to experience what's new or different if you've never experienced, but also if it's something you have experienced and then you realize you're not alone because others have uh, felt the same way that you do. So I've always loved fiction and I, I'm not one that wants to write about myself or my family. Although I am, I have an Aunt Josephine uh, who I've never met because she died at 17 of tuberculosis in 1944. And her siblings, my dad, my aunts and uncles, they have talked about her. She lives on with them. And I've had an idea about writing something loosely based, not, not nonfiction, but a novel um, where, and I have letters that she wrote to a friend when she was in the sanitarium. Um, and I would thread them throughout the novel, but I would like to show how her siblings' lives were influenced by her and what things she said to them in those last months that made them take certain paths. Um, so in that light, I've done a lot of research, family research that I would use. But um, as far as a personal memoir, I, my life's not that interesting. So. <laughs> oh. Well, I, I beg to differ. I, I would be happy to read a memoir from you. <laughs> but, um, there are a couple of other questions. One is, what is the best writing advice you've received and how did you put it into practice? Well, I I can't remember who because I've read it a trillion times that what they say is you have to just sit down and write. Um, it's not, you can't wait for the muse. You can't wait for, you know, some inspiration just sit down and if you just get a paragraph out, great. And you might move on to two pages or four pages. Um, and I've seen that repeatedly. And the other thing is just persevere as far as, you know, trying to get published, trying to get your work seen. I think that today there are so many different places to send your work or even just create a blog that you can get an audience to read your work. And that is just, I think that's very inspiring for writers, so. Wonderful. We have a couple of other questions. Um, one is, who is your most beloved character in Luz? Oh, oh, oh. I think I know who asked this, too. Um, well, first of all, I, 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 you can't really say who's your favorite character. It's like saying who's your favorite child, you know, and I have two listening. And so uh, I love them both equally and they know that. Or my favorite grandchild. I love them both passionately. But um Alma Manuel, I mean, I loved all of them, but Berta, Berta is my favorite character because Berta, if you could write a story just about her life, she loved and lost and loved and lost. And yet she keeps loving again and again. She's not afraid to love. She keeps loving. She has so much love to give and she cooks and bakes. So I want to go sit in her kitchen with all the little cows and I want her to cook and bake for me, so. <laughs> I love her too. And I love that you use the word love around her. I feel like your whole book is so suffused with love and it was clearly written with so much love. And I'm eager to see it find its way into characters, or not characters, but readers' hearts, because I know they will love it as much as I do. So we also have a question about what is the meaning behind the white calla lily on the book cover? Well, first of all, when I first came out to uh, Southern California, it's the first time I saw white calla lilies. I love them, the tall trumpet flowers. And in fact, my daughter, when I married my, my husband, Bruce, 20 years ago, my daughter held just one white calla lily. Oh. My daughter. And um, so when I was writing the book and, and I was thinking, oh, Ma, let's see, her, her father would, you know, he would send them T-shirts and stickers and stars when he would be working in the States. He'd send little packages. And I thought she would have a little box to keep these in so that when he came home uh, and she wanted to show him her schoolwork, he, you know, he put, and I thought, a little box. And I love painted wooden boxes. I've seen them painted by all different cultures. They're beautiful. And so I thought, okay, it's a blue one with a white collar lily on it. And then, of course, further on in the book, when um, she sees the notebook with this blue with the white collar lily that becomes her math journal. Um, to me, the, the white collar lily, it's white, purity and innocence. Um, it blossoms in the spring, so it's new beginnings. And it's perennial. It comes back every year, so resilience and hope. That's what the color really means to me. And I thought Rebecca alone did the most beautiful job on the yeah, color. It's gorgeous. You know, I mean, I get, I said, how about blue with a color, but this is gorgeous. And, and it took some work getting the flame right, 
but I think she, Rebecca Lone is her name. Beautiful job. Yes. She writes press, does stunning covers. Yes. Just stunning covers, they do. I agree. All right, looks like we have one more question. Um, this is Sean. I, I should have been reading the, the names of the people before. But Sean asks, I didn't realize they already had the underground sensors back in the 90s. Can you talk about the new deterrence the migrants have to overcome now 20 years later? Uh, I imagine it's just much of the same increased border patrol um, and uh, that's that's probably part of it. And helicopters, of course, which of course were also in the book. But uh, how widespread the the lighting and the underground sensors were, I'm sure it took a while. But that was in the works back then. Um, and um, you know, now it's just well. Also, there was, and I wrote a poem for you. Um, if you remember, right, that you published yeah, that about the fence, um, the initial fence, and it's actually one that that. Um, that that Alma will, will uh, confront uh, has slats and that, you know, people could actually get over. And when they discovered that they decided to put up a second fence, a parallel fence that was harder. And so that's the sort of thing you'll see today, uh, uh, the kind of fence that they feel like they can't climb over, that they can't dig under. Uh, of course, when it comes to uh, drug smuggling, they will always find a way, um, you know, for them to get over, over. And, and so will people who are desperate, they'll always find a way to find a better life, to find safety. Um. Well, thank you. It looks like this is all the questions. Um, Debbie, I know there was another little piece you wanted to read before we close. Um, oh, you mean about thanking? Uh, Roman, <laughs> okay. <laughs> <laughs> I thought you meant another piece from here. No, I just wanted to say, um, and I sort of mentioned it earlier, that I'm, I'm just so thankful to Romans for doing this for me. And that I know so many of you, uh, first of all, how wonderful this virtual experience was. Because if, if we had this uh, launch at the actual bookstore, most of you wouldn't be able to be here. I'm looking at the, the, the thing on the side, not up here. Um, you wouldn't be able to be here. And even those of you who live in the area, I mean, traffic and schedules and children, so um, I'm just so thrilled that we had this virtual experience, but I would so much like you to purchase something from Vroman's. Um, and if it's not another copy of my book, which you could donate to someone if you don't already have one, um, as I said, you know, some of the books that I mentioned, Gail's books, Amelie's Bean Way of his books, um, and um, the, you know, the, the book that I told you about by Carla Cornejo Via Vicencio, The Undocumented Americans, um, I just think that's such an important, important book. I hope it's so wonderful to see all the voices raised together across our country right now. I think of Mary Oliver's quote that hearts have been broken open and hopefully will not close to the rest of the world. I think open hearts and voices, uh, you know, together right now. I just hope that we'll also remember the children that are in detention centers, the families that are separated, those families on the other side of the border waiting for asylum, which is a legal claim. In, in the, so I hope that we won't, don't look away, which is a hashtag. Um, and keep in mind, uh, homelessness is increasing. I saw that because of our, our economy, COVID situation. So let our voices talk about all sorts of uh, social injustices or just problems right now that need our love and our voice. That's kind of what I close Thank with. you for being such a compassionate voice, Debbie. And I'm so Thank grateful you. that your voice is in the world. It's Thank been you. a real joy to talk to you. It's tonight. been a joy working with you. you have, you've inspired me so many times when I wanted to give up. And it's a thrill that you're with me today. And Alma Luz Villanueva, I wish you could have been here. I hope that the lightning hasn't, uh, you know, struck. I hope everything's okay. We miss you, Alma. We feel you with in spirit. Uh, thank you so much, Deborah and Gail. Like, I wish I could, like, give you a round of applause along with our audience, <laughs> but we'll just have to uh, settle with my applause. Um, Again, if you are um, if you are interested in supporting our bookstore, uh, please click on the green purchase button directly below the viewer screen. It will take you uh, to our website where you can continue your purchase of Lutes. And you can also look for any of the books that were mentioned uh, during this virtual event, as well as Gail's books. 
And um, we are going to be doing more virtual events in the near future. So if you would like to uh, learn more about that, just visit our website, uh, subscribe to our Crowdcast channel, as, we're, as well as our newsletter. And we are continuing to uh, do curbside pickups. So if you would like to order your book and pick it up at our store, you can do that. Um, and I think that's about it. Thank you for, thank you to everyone who joined in. Thank you, Deborah. Thank you, Gail, once again. It was wonderful having you. Thanks, Rira. It's been a joy. All right. Good night, everyone. Good night, everyone. Stay safe, stay well.